First of all, it's a delight to see so many of you here. I thought I would have perhaps as many as 20 <laughs> around a table and that we would have a sort of cosy debate about the themes which I want to talk about. But secondly, this is very much a personal approach in that it's a, a draft of what I might try and develop um, more fully as a book. So there's, I hope, um, a, as I will call it later on, altruistic self-interest <laughs> in my uh, accepting this uh, invitation, and I'm very grateful to you, Richard, for um, extending it to me. But it is, by the very nature of what I'm hoping that at some stage I may be able to do, it is actually a personal story. Forgive me for that, because none of these things of any uh, note or worth are usually achieved by a single person. It's by a whole team. And not tonight, but on another occasion, what I would wish to develop, if I look back over my life, I would see prophecy not actually by individuals now, but largely through institutions, about the role of prophetic institutions in our society. But that is not actually what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about poverty, life chances, and back to destitution, because it is a tale of the age through which I've lived politically. For it starts in 1969 when I joined the Child Poverty Action Group. And I think it's true that since Freud, if not um, before, from our, our upbringing, none of us truly know ourselves and our motives. And while I would like to think that the reason I applied for a job at Child Poverty Action Group was that it was simply altruistic in that here was a marvellous opportunity to try and campaign on a national stage for those who were kicked down to the bottom of our society. I also have to admit that uh, for me, I saw it as an advantage that I wished to go into the House of Commons and I thought I didn't have any expertise to equip me to be anything but lobby fodder should I actually go in without that training. Training, of course, I now realise, comes from almost any profession, occupation, task that one undertakes. But though that, again, shows the naivety of me back um, prior to 1969. What I did find, however, when I uh, joined CPAG, these two little attic rooms when I was interviewed in one of the rooms where there was no carpet or underfelt, it had worn away, and I was put in the chair to be questioned by the good people of the Child Poverty Action Group's executive about how much I knew about poverty, and I came from a working-class household which then could boast that I was free of that experience. I had no personal experience nor was I part of what was becoming a growing uh, academic movement around Richard Titmus to produce um, social uh, administration, social policy uh, departments from which I and others talked of the Titmice leaving to go and take his views like apostles to all corners of the earth. I not only therefore inherited as, with, with the grand title of director, I'm sure that was put in because it's a way of lowering the salary, but also in these um, two rooms, one had a policy cupboard, and there was nothing in the policy cupboard. <laughs> I also learned that the Child Poverty Action Group, before I was appointed, had been uh, subjected to a hostile takeover bid by Shelter. In those wonderful days when Shelter was led by Des Wilson, who was the genius for concentrating the public mind on the evil effects of such grim housing that so many poorer and working class families had to endure, uh, that it broke CPAG's spirit and that a large minority of the, uh, the executive were in favour of the takeover bid. 
a majority just had actually um, maintained a, major a, a majority not to do so. So I was the fall guy, so to speak, from those who wished not to accept the takeover, but were deeply unsure what the direction of CPAG should be. Um, there were, of course, policy propos proposals that I found in the cupboard, I think of seven pages, but they were very much um, dry bones. Um, and there was growing discontent amongst membership of the CPAG, who, like the, the population as a whole in 1914, were persuaded the war would be over by Christmas, most of those thought, with the election of the 1964 Labour government, that the fight would be over, poverty would be abolished by Christmas. So we resisted for a long time, this is before I came, having any membership or even opening a bank account. Why should a, a group founded from a group of Quaker meetings ever want anything as permanent on this earth as bank accounts and membership. And when Christmas came and went, and Christmas came and went, and Christmas came and went, and Christmas came and went, um, and the Labour government um, uh, tactics, uh, maybe, maybe they were uh, honourable, but rather like last night's vote in the House, House of Commons, of devising techniques of not doing anything, set up inquiry after inquiry after inquiry. Indeed, there were four major ones, um, which, of course, allowed ministers to say, we're waiting for the inquiry before we can actually say anything about what we might um, do. So for me, here was the first lesson for a reformer, that when one pulled out this, the dry bones from the cupboard, we had a document... Um, and a strategy which was unintelligible to voters. It was unintelligible to actually the whole of the executive committee um, because we had hit on a policy that we should increase um, family allowances and claw back the increase from, quotes richer workers, i.e. those over the tax threshold, by... Uh, by adjusting tax allowances so that nobody over the tax allowance threshold would be better off. And you can see immediately the difficulties of campaign that should have been talking about the poor um, and, their, and justice for them and a sweeping measure that might actually relieve that poverty and maybe optimistically abolish it we had this technical discussion in public, if we were ever on radio or television or in the newspapers, the advantages of disadvantages of what were called clawback. Now, you really have to be a genius to devise a reform strategy that would actually rustle up enthusiasm for a rallying cry, we're all in favour of the clawback. Um, particularly when I was rewriting the... Um, that preliminary document for our next submission about trying to move CPAG from where we were to a different political ground and I wanted examples of the clawback working, I then, as I say, discovered that none of the executive, however clever they were, however important their professorial chairs were, no matter how many times they put their names to this reform, could actually work out what it would actually mean in practical terms. So there was a lesson for me there. But it was also, in a sense, a move in the wrong direction. Uh, in that, by operating this clawback of singling out poor families from supposedly richer families... Uh, we were actually making families pay to deal with family or child poverty rather than presenting the bill as we should have been to taxpayers as a whole and particularly to richer taxpayers. It also raised, of course, the whole business about means testing versus 
universalism. And that came up when the current mega-reform, as we were told, and uh, uh, Ian Duncan Smith, in, with some justice, says that his reform is the great, greatest reform since Beveridge, universal credit, we were debating before the House Commons yet again yesterday. It is a debate about means testing and universalism. Um, and it is a debate between those who believe it is best to campaign to try and use <clears throat> whatever sums you have to help the very poorest against those of the position that I wanted to get CPAG into, that it, we were not interested in this clawback lark and all the rest of it, but that we were actually about underpinning people with um, then family allowances, now child benefit, and later, which I will come on to, a, a minimum wage. Um, and the reasons for that were simple, about, and you may well claim it is simple theology. It was about my understanding about mankind, if I want to dress it up in grand terms, or in everyday language. It was a belief about how I think human beings respond. And it's a key factor here is about the role of altruism. I do not believe, as many of people on the left of goodwill who, who um, take other proper views separate from mine, believe you can run a society on altruism alone. I do not believe that's a strong enough uh, motive force in human nature. Um, I do believe there are special occasions in which you can appeal for altruism, for very, very limited and clearly defined goals for a limited period of time. But if you want in welfare a sustained altruistic element, that altruism itself must be based on self-interest. Self Hence the phrase which I tried to use from the beginning of CPAGs, the idea of self-interested altruism. And that's why all through my life at CPAG and through the House of Commons I've been trying to propose there aren't any shortcuts on the payment of welfare to the idea of a national insurance system of some kind. Of course we would want that system comprehensive, of course we would want that system paid for by progressive contributions. But if the welfare state is to be sustained, if it is to advance, then the vast majority of the of country have got to see it's in their interests that this welfare state prospers. Um, and increasingly, a means-tested approach did not actually uh, give us that. So again, it's, um, uh, the self-interested altruism was based on how one saw I saw, coming from a working-class home, um, how you could crucially uh, either alienate or harbour the, uh, the impulses of decent working-class instincts which would themselves benefit poorer people. That was, of course, a starting point. Now, of course, the size of social classes have changed, but I don't believe human nature has changed that much and I believe to um, have policy after policy that roughs up human nature and moves in a direction which human nature finds hard to cope with, you are actually in, um, in difficulties. The other aspect in these early days of Child Poverty Action Group was of course what political strategy could we have which might knock a Labour government into action? Um, they, for those of you who are around in those dark days, um, or well, they, prohib they appear less dark now <laughs> in reflection, knew how difficult it was to move the Wilson government to action, and particularly action um, uh, um, uh, favouring the poor. Uh, but part of my reading of, of um, Dick Crossman, who was the great Labour a uh, theoretician, or that's how he rightly probably thought of himself, um, of when he was a teacher, wrote a, a lengthy introduction 
to Badgett's The English Constitution. It was almost a third of the size that Badgett took to actually describe what he wanted to describe. But in that, Crossman talked about the role of myths in political parties, that all parties have myths. They don't always bear much reality um, into their everyday um, conduct, but they're very, very important and never more important as an election approaches because in that key period they help mobilise the activists in a belief about how they can shape the future. And he kindly listed that the, the, um, the myth in a way that religious would actually understand the word myth and the Labour Party was that the Labour Party was essentially about helping the poor. And I thought, thank you. Here's actually the framework in which I can write a document if I can stand it up honestly about Labour's record to the poor, thinking that Crossman himself would have read aright how, how political parties operate. And it resulted in a document built up from my notebooks, or the theme of which the poor get poorer under Labour. The mistake, if there was one, was providential luck. That actually, by the time we'd published this document, Crossman was the minister responsible to having a say in what we should do following the, uh, the CPAG's memoranda. And Crossman had sort of ele elephantine abilities to trumpet around and trample on people and, and enjoy that without seeing the danger both to the wider goal that he and we were trying to achieve. So he thought he had flattened us at CPAG and he, d he behaved in the most appalling way at the meeting Peter Townsend and I had with him. The only thing he didn't do was punch us or swing from the mega chandelier over his table, but practically else was done and then said, you know, to Brian Abel Smith, his assistant, we've done them, haven't we? Um, for a change in tradition in that year, 69, leading up to the election, Roy Jenkins discussed with the Cabinet the outlines of his budget. And at that point, Crossman made the case for an increase in uh, family allowances. And, of course, Roy Jenkins had no difficulty at all in saying that when we discuss... CPAG's um, uh, pre-election, as it turned out to be, it wasn't written as one, a document, The Poor Get Poor Under Labour, you told us, didn't you, Dick, that it was, it was sh more than shaky, there wasn't, there wasn't any evidence for this case. So why are you now putting forward the case for an increase in, in family allowances? So Dick had kindly dug a hole, pushed us in it, and fell in it after himself. Um, and the losers, I think, were the poor, not because, and I then tried not to take political sides, but because it followed by a Tory government that broke its promise to Child Poverty Action Group to in, in, uh, increase uh, child benefit, but for reasons I could talk to you afterwards or in, in questions, uh, they brought in the first, the means-tested supplements to help families, poor families, called the Family Income Supplement. And today it's, um, in a sense, uh, this monster has grown into universal credit with the help of uh, Tory and Labour governments on the way. But during that period at, at CPAG and then in the House of Commons, um, there wasn't just um, the need to review strategy but also to think about what are, the, what are the objectives and how do they relate to how the group defined poverty. Because how one defined poverty, I felt, was the link or the non-link with the wider community called voters. Um, I thought it important that CPAG was seen not to be an appendage of the Labour Party, and nobody felt it was an appendage of the Labour Party after our 1970 campaign, as I um, experienced only too well, wishing to have a Labour seat. Um, but also this defini definition of poverty, which came from Peter Townsend and Brian Abel Smith, 
which was that we have a benefit level in this country um, and that should be the minimum income or, without really much debate, the poverty line. And because you could get additions to that poverty line, we better call it 140% of the minimum income given by governments to people who were, and here and again was a crucial factor, for people who couldn't work. Um, this was pushed by CPAG and me um, for some of the time um, and what I love to call the wider poverty movement as giving us the poverty data in this country. But there was a real fault line here in that if you take 100 or even 140 percent of the minimum income, which was the supplementary benefit payments then, the more the government um, uh, conceded to campaigners and to its own conscience that we should increase the living standards of those on benefit, the government would thereby be increasing the numbers of poor because that would be the measurement, the cut-off point. Whereas in fact, if one uh, lowered the uh, definition and made it worse for the poor, you could actually reduce the numbers of poor. And here, for me, was a dilemma which we, as poverty campaigners, really didn't solve, and it lost support amongst voters. And if one was thinking about these long wilderness years of labour and its loss of working-class votes, this is part of that much wider story. They didn't recognise um, as being poor those people or the incomes that we spoke about as representing poverty. That was partly because of the shape of the distribution of income in our country, but also there was, I, that one realised very quickly, a huge time lag between those respectable working class families um, and their views about poverty, which were based in the 1930s, and what most of them have act, had actually experienced themselves and what we were saying was now today's poverty. So we'd failed to change their conceptions of what, in fact, um, poverty was about. Uh, it also, of course, um, concentrated on people on benefit, this whole approach, and ignored the problem of um, a deeply unjust position where people earned their poverty. Um, and for, again, for quite honest reasons, uh, I um, sought money to establish the low pay unit, which would be separate from CPAG, because I'd hoped I'd remain there um, after any election if I was successful in being adopted. But um, that was made necessary because Philip Roundtree, the son of Seaburn Roundtree, the great innovator of a clearly defined poverty line in this country, or at least that's what you think until you start probing, was not prepared to release the money to do it unless he was chairman of the body that was actually running it. So we had human nature again operating. Uh, why not accept that deal um, um, uh, and, and start to register? And again, it's quite interesting to show how quickly Debates can change, both to the advantage of the poor, as I will conclude, sadly, to their great disadvantage um, in the last few years at the end of this um, address. And this uh, little unit, um, financed by uh, Philip's father's retirement fund when Seabone retired from the chocolate factory, um, housed in a building which uh, Roundtree Trust had bought to bring pressure groups, campaigns together. We campaigned on two things. One was we then had a statutory minimum wage machinery which was called the Wages Councils, many of which had not met for 10, 12, 15 years. It was to be a secretariat to make sure they met to raise wages in those sectors covered by a, st a statutory minimum wage, but also to campaign for a national minimum wage. Um, and there was the low pay unit, which was this body 
with uh, Seabone Roundtree's retirement fund paying for, and two trade unionists from one union, Newpee, Alan Fisher and Rodney Bickerstaff, who sadly died the other day, without any other support at all for this reform. Um, it's easy now to think, gosh, they, it must have been come down from Mount Sinai. Um, every other trade unionist and trade union was against this approach. It would cause unemployment, it would, it would cause insufferable uh, concentration of uh, differentials. Um, and from that position, um, in the, uh, of setting up the low pay unit, within 10 years we had a reform on the statute book. Uh, huge numbers of people were, of course, um, involved in that. But originally there was a little pressure group, low pay unit, and two wonderful trade union leaders who stood out against every one of their colleagues to campaign for this actual front. And in doing so, in that work at the low pay unit and making up, as we did, um, what should be the minimum wage level for which we uh, campaign, we hit on a percentage of um, average earnings. And that became the benchmark in, once it became a great, one of the great driving forces for the Blair government to put through, um, on a statutory basis, um, a national minimum wage. But again, the problem here was that the, um, um, the, the success of defining poverty by this cut-off point relating to average earnings meant, in the way that our economy works, that in times when the economy is growing fast and the distribution of income widens, generally speaking, the numbers of poor increase, although, the number, although many, of those, many, many, many of those poor are actually better off than the economy not performing and growing. Conversely, the awful situation when the economy goes into slump, uh, when income differentials are concertinaed, the numbers of poor fall because your cut-off point, given the distribution of the numbers of people in the labour force, um, uh, falls and the number of poor fall. Uh, but the, uh, the result is the numbers of poor are actually worse off in that situation than when the economy is growing. Which brings us really back to um, the second theme, which was trying to find a new way out of this, what I found was a cul-de-sac. At the end of the Labour government's life, it introduced a bill to abolish child poverty by legislation. Who could be against that? I thought it was fraudulent in that we knew then that despite the huge resources Gordon Brown had found from your pockets, uh, the steam was running out of a programme where we should only be concerned with money as a way of combating child poverty, um, but also the 13 billion or so necessary to implement the act that people were, were with, that, with, you know, with good hearts voting for, uh, there was never any chance, I believed, of that 13 billion or so arriving in the circumstances we were at the end of that Labour government, let, an, uh, let alone the circumstances which soon engulfed um, a coalition government. But Cameron, in this attempt to look soft and cuddly um, and many other things, uh, whipped his MPs to vote for the Act, though he was deeply troubled by the definition that was used for poverty, it was an image problem. And here was another way in which the mirrors could be tilted somewhat, how the public would see the Tory party, because they would be, gro uh, they would be part of that group of people who were championing the needs of the poor. Uh, I wanted to divide the house, but couldn't find anyone to divide me on that. I thought the whole thing was... And so I spoke against it, and I thought the fraud that it was. After the election, I call him Stevie Wonder, but I think most of people, if they know, recall his name now, know him as Steve Hilton. 
approached me on whether I do a report for the coalition government to dump the poverty data, which I'd spoken against, but never called for their dumping. For all the faults I've just talked about, measuring it against uh, income support levels plus 40% or an cu- arbitrary cut-off point against average earnings, at least it was a set of data that we had. And the idea of abolishing that set of data and not having any chance whatsoever of reporting to the nation on the numbers of poor did not fill me with pleasure. I did hit in the negotiations that, were going with, that I was having with Stevie Wonder on behalf of the, of, uh, the Prime Minister, I hit about on the idea, what about, sorry, what about a inquiry and a report on life chances? Now, the, I don't know where the idea, where I pulled up that idea from. It must have been in the air. It was clearly, looking back on it, talked by many people, because that why would I have actually picked up this um, phrase? But I thought it might just give us um, that strategy of getting us out the cul-de-sac of these arbitrary definitions and definitions which often produce data on the numbers of poor, which many particularly working class, class households simply couldn't believe, um, and give us a strategy which both Labour and Tories might um, move behind. The, this is, of course, an age before the crash. So if one was in the confessional now, I'd be saying (laughs) I want some thought given to um, the sins of commission that I'm actually confessing, but also please, um, Lord, take into account the circumstances in which I was committing what now clearly appears to be a somewhat foolhardy, although one day I do believe it will become central to government uh, action. And what one wanted to do in the foundation years to look at life chances, uh, looking specifically at children under five, was not to do simple correlations about whether you got on or you didn't get on, but to ask this wonderfully talented group at the University of Bristol, could they move us beyond uh, the simple um, 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 comparisons between uh, those circumstances Um, correlations to drivers of poverty and specifically were there drivers um, which could lend themselves to political programs uh, which would be which showed themselves in the data to be stronger than class and income in other words that they would trump class and income in the first time in our strategy of trying to improve the, the lot of the poor. And Bristol came up for our foundation uh, um, years report, which was entitled Foundation Years, Preventing Poor Children from Becoming Poor Adults, that there were three areas at least in which we could operate in which would have major cha- uh, changes in the life chances of the poorest children, and that would hold irrespective of income. Whether that would hold now to the situation, which is the, the, uh, the fourth theme, this being the third, that I actually want to get on to, I would question, given the depths now of poverty that we are seeing created. But in, those, in the run-up to the crash, Bristol University found for us that there were three key factors in determining a a child's life chances. One was the bonding with the mother. The second was the mental health of the mother. And clearly those two are being linked because if the mother, uh, as a result of postnatal depression, um, is alienated for a long period of time from her child, there ain't going to be much bonding. And thirdly, there was what Guardian readers would, uh, including me as a Guardian reader, would recognise what's called the home learning environment. Were there books? Were there the right toys? And did you spend time with your children? And so on. Um, And that was the essence of the report um, that went to David Cameron, which of course enshrined the original ideas for Sure Start, 
um, Tessa Jow and David Blunkett wanted uh, Sure Start to be family focused. Um, and although they didn't um, highlight those three areas, talk to Jessa, uh, Tessa Jow, read what she was saying then. It was all about a great leap forward in ensuring that the most vulnerable were going to bond well with their children and finding, in fact, uh, ways around the barriers to that bonding and that home learning environment. It failed, of course, because very quickly the, the, the Sure Start industry um, developed a language which I picked up going round the country for the report on the foundation years when I'd say, where are the most vulnerable? And I would be treated like a poor delinquent child, which perhaps I was and am. Oh, you don't understand, Frank. They're so difficult to reach. They're the hard to reach. So I said, we've now got a language which has been developed which excuses your failure. Hard to reach? Don't have to bother about them. They're all out there. Rather than the programme has to be about that and the strategy has to be about that in reaching them. And project after project after project, the bushy-tailed mums were in there benefiting wonderfully from Sure Start and a real absence of those parents um, most uh, in need of commitment and support. Um, the uh, legacies of this um, um, strategy um, was really that very, very late in the day when Cameron realised how frail human beings we are and he was searching for a legacy, he began to go back to ideas about a life chances strategy but the government fell ever before that great strategy, had it been written, uh, was in fact um, ever published. Although a group of people interested in implementing the main reports about what are those three factors which can trump income and class, um, did set up the Foundation Years Trust and are by experiment trying to see whether that can work. Which brings me on to the fourth area of, of my work, of one coming into poverty with this great opportunity to join CPAG, of um, force of circumstance, trying to back up a campaign which was really about people on benefit, or with one which was about people also in low pay. The idea of trying to see whether they, it was a new strategy with life chances, to what is, quite, what is now a quite horrendous situation, which I never, ever, ever expected to experience in my lifetime, which is the re-emergence of destitution. Um, uh, and again, it's a, uh, it's a period we're talking beyond the crash, but it doesn't only just involve the crash. Um, the crash and the follow-through, there were a whole series of choices that were made, um, the, um, the lead up to the crash and post crash about the ideas that globalization what would benefit everybody without ever thinking what the time scale was for that benefit. Some people were going to benefit much more quickly than others, and surprise, surprise, it was the poor who were going to take the strain, uh, suffer the uh, cost of adjustments, but maybe in the future benefit from that globalized market. And there then has also been um, to accompany the changes in the labour market, the, the dropping away in the labour market, as, as I could best describe it in this country, for poorer people, the advent of universal credit and how that is actually uh, playing out. And it's the combination of a ruthless labour market which now has the abilities, uh, or gives employers abilities to push those wages down and to avoid any legislation which is on the statute book, which itself is one of the agents of destitution, linked with what is, what is turning out to be, I'm, I'm sure nobody who thought of it ever 
dreamt of it, seeing it in the way that I now see it as being, of universal credit as being the first move in the welfare state which on a mass scale undermines, the, I think, the country's uh, conception of what a welfare state is about. Up to universal credit, there was a belief, however frail, however silly, however stupid uh, or bright, there was going to be a minimum tucked below each of us so that the weakest underbelly that any of us might have would be protected by a welfare strategy which ensured that there was a minimum and you couldn't be exploited below that minimum. We now have a, a welfare benefit which uh, didn't come down Mount Sinai, so don't believe it came down in tablets of stone. This benefit was designed by mankind, defended mankind by, by mankind, and doing the most horrendous things to what were decent but now poor and, I would argue, de many destitute families. Because we have a benefit uh, of which once you sign on, you cannot expect money for six weeks when we have a, gr a growing proportion of the country with no savings at all and m perhaps moving on to benefit from a job which was in the gig economy which you had to argue over what you were getting and you would uh, all too often are being denied the uh, national living wage. So we, we're upper middle class people, the, the, the model of the human beings going on to this benefit, who've got savings, who can manage, who've budgeted, who can well um, survive six weeks without payment, even if the benefit is paid on time. Um, and the government does not collect data on the numbers, for example, who uh, have been waiting 12 weeks with no benefit. Um, in my uh, political life, uh, as lobbyist, it has been all along, really, I know that however small the political reform, welfare reform has been, governments had prided themselves on monitoring it. This the initiator claims is the biggest re reform since Beveridge and there is almost no data of relevance to a debate about how it's working, more importantly how it's not working and the evil, it is evil, of what it's doing to the poor. Uh, it certainly isn't collecting data that supposing by hook or by crook that you actually survive the 8, 10, 12 weeks by somehow by um, keeping a roof above your head so you, um, that's the drive of all those heading for destitution they go without food they go out without any heating or lighting in their homes to, uh, to try and defend their tenancy for they know that if they lose the tenancy they are lost probably as a family um, so those who actually manage to survive that um, and remain as a family and remain claiming universal credit for one of the great claims it helps people into work I know claimants who've given up work because it's um, um, been so difficult to survive from the transfer from tax credits to universal credit but for those who actually do survive uh, this six, eight, ten, twelve week wait, uh, often at best with an advance which might cover some of your expenses for the first two weeks. No data is being collected on, on what shape are those families in. Do they ever recover from the debt that they are plunged into? Uh, do they ever get a budgeting back of which they are not having to rely on food banks to ensure that they, they and their children, mainly their children primarily, um, are fed. Um, and the question I asked the Secretary of State three times yesterday, th 
three times he declined to give an answer. And that was in Birkenhead, our wonderful, wonderful food bank. But whoever thought we'd be praising food banks in our society, but they are wonderful given the situation that we're in, estimates that as universal, hits, universal credit hits us um, for uh, Christmas, they will need in the coming year 15 million tons, 15 tons, sorry, 15 tons more food. Um, and I asked the Secretary of State, you're telling us it's going to roll out perfectly well in Birkenhead. There's going to be no problems whatsoever. Why are you running these scare stories? So when I go home at the weekend, what's my message? Is it to those really good people who feed the poor in Birkenhead? Don't listen to the food bank, full of scare stories, trying to fill up their uh, warehouse to protect people from hunger. Because the Secretary has told me there won't be a need for these extra uh, tonnes of food. Or, in fact, do I say, Secretary of State, that you are so uncertain to give that guarantee that you don't in your heart believe this benefit is actually going to work, as you claim, and that we ought to believe the food bank, rather than dismiss it, um, in planning for this coming year. Three times asked, three times not. All these biblical <laughs> analogies, aren't there, about the crow <laughs> crying three times and so on. But on this occasion, sadly, there was no answer with the third crowing. Um, in, in putting it down to um, the um, Secretary of State. And as I see what we've now got in a world I never believed that we would see, we, would, uh, we, would, we find families everywhere in every constituency at some stages now fighting hunger, initially through food banks or some other wonderful initiatives, who are going without, they cannot afford, they've had their power cut off without food or light. So um, last Christmas, the, the uh, hampers that were provided in Birkenhead had candles in them um, and had food which you could eat without cooking. While, thank goodness, getting on to end power, who's given us a whole new initiative of being able to offer everybody without power in their homes, to have the money for two weeks to be connected. Um, and that's operated over the last year in Birkenhead. And what do the other energy companies do? They go to the Competitions Authority and claim this is unfair competition. Um, that anybody coming into the food bank, they don't have to be end power customers, will actually get help. And they are claiming, instead of actually saying, we will do that, they're actually trying to and have successfully closed down the N Power campaign to offer free cr credit for two weeks for power while um, people seek help to sort their benefits out and so on. So let me, if, if I may therefore, on this sombre note, draw from those heady days uh, uh, during my lifetime when many of us would share these aspirations that we um, had a Labour government, the Wilson government, and that we would see the end of poverty as we know it in our lifetime. To the record that I've given in a personal um, approach to, but landing up in this, uh, this unbelievable spot of being the fifth or sixth richest nation in the earth, and seeing the re-emergence of destitution. And that comes partly from the man-made acceptance of the dominance of global markets. We didn't have to go down this route. We could have actually said that is not for us. Uh, we're going to take a much longer term view, although I could, one knew all the problems in reforming the British economy to adopt that approach. And also, this mega change in the welfare state, which now has a measure which destroys a certain safety net for people who are clearly out of luck and down at the bottom. 
And instead of lifting them up, instead of protecting the weakest underbelly in our society, pushes them into a state that we've never seen poor, poor people in my lifetime before, and that is destitute, hungry, without power, and fighting desperately to prevent uh, homelessness. Now, it doesn't mean to say there aren't other factors here that one might want to actually talk about later that actually contribute to this, um, exacerbate it. But I don't want in any way to think if one talks about family structure, um, if one looks at loss of parenting skills, or further about the gig economy, I want there to be any, any uh, of you present to think that the two dominating factors which have given rise to destitution in our country, both man-made, both de um, um, decisions taken by groups largely, almost totally, of men, um, though getting better in the House of Commons. One is where, how the global markets worked, and secondly, this political decision to implement a reform which beguiles us with the idea, isn't it, wouldn't it be simple if all these benefits were rolled into one? I don't think it's all that great, never did. Because if you've got six benefits, the chances are you might get five of them being paid to you. If you've only got one benefit and you lose that one benefit, you've had it. But also, uh, secondly, the whole ideological um, uh, basis of this um, uh, about whether you're out, uh, whether you're about trying to build flaws under people, by which they build with their own efforts as they can, or whether you build ceilings through which it's most almost impossible for them to push through. So uh, that, if I may say, they were the themes I wanted to um, depress you with tonight. Um, I don't know whether I've. I hope I've succeeded in the comprehensive side and the comprehension as I probably have succeeded in depressing you. For that I apologise, but that is the record. Amen. Amen.